glorious Shout it out and glorious Make it louder Jesus we shout your name Jesus we make your praise glorious You are glorious
him. Oh, he's a glorious God and he only deserves glorious praise. He doesn't deserve half-hearted praise. No, my friend, if you come here, you've come here to praise the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul. Everything God wants from us is everything, you know. He wants every he doesn't want half. He doesn't want 70%, 80%. Everything you've got and that applies even to the way you sing. You your attitude in praise and worship is very important. You give it your best. No matter what that is, you give it your best. It's not very important that you sing perfectly. Give it your best. God looks at your heart. He looks at your attitude. And when you give him your best, my friend, oh my friend, that prepares you for much more. Praise and worship is the gateway to your victory. How many of you believe that? This time is a very important time. It's where we put our focus on God. It's where we zero in on God. It's where his glory, his majesty becomes real to us. and god is willing to reveal himself to those who are willing to look upon him let's continue to praise him and worship him great and glorious we put our trust in your name jesus able to save and deliver us we put our hope in your name jesus blessing and honor glory and power to i got forever and ever all of the honor all of the praise is yours yours forever
your hands and praise the Lord our God is in control hope you notice those words steadfast immovable nothing's impossible our God reigns forever oh our God reigns my friend your God reigns he's on the throne know this today no matter what situation seem like God is on the throne nothing moves him nothing disturbs him like it disturbs us if we just put our eyes on him, we can get that same calmness, that peace. That peace with which Jesus was standing on the water when Peter was sinking. You see, nothing moved Jesus. It moved Peter. But nothing moved Jesus, my friend. Put your eyes on Jesus. Put your eyes on God today. And you will experience that inner peace that God has for you. No matter what your circumstances, God can give you peace. And not only that, God can give you victory on the outside as well. Peace on the inside will be followed by victory on the outside. All we need to do is put our eyes on God. And even during this service, we are about to partake of communion. And let us orient our thoughts in that direction. Let us think about what Jesus has done for us. Let us think about his suffering, his death, his resurrection, what that means. What difference it makes for us. Oh, let's sing these next couple of songs with that in mind. And let us exalt Jesus in our midst. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love. A sinner condemned unclean How marvelous, how wonderful And my soul shall ever be How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love 
When we the ransomed in glory His face I at last shall see Will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love Jesus, risen and exalted one in our midst. Oh, we worship you, O Lord. Oh, we praise you, O Lord. Oh, it's an honor to stand here and worship you, O God. Oh, Father God, help us 
we sense the presence of Jesus in our midst. The risen Lord Jesus is in our midst. The victorious Lord Jesus is in our midst. He lives forevermore. He reigns forevermore. Oh, help us, Father, to sense that as a reality, oh God, not just to know that Jesus lives, but to actually experience his presence right now, oh God. Oh, help us to experience your presence, oh God. Oh, help us to experience the power of your presence. Oh, the clarity of your presence. The peace of your presence. Oh, Lord, the anointing of your presence. Oh, we welcome the Spirit of God in our midst. Oh, may the Spirit of God come and move mightily in our midst. Oh, may the Spirit of God open our eyes, open our ears, move in our hearts, enlighten our minds. Oh, may the Spirit of God draw us closer unto you this morning. We pray for each person in this place. You know their particular, specific needs, oh God. And you know how to meet their needs. You are more than enough for their every need, for their every problem. You are Jesus. You are God's solution for everyone, for everything, oh God. We look to you, Jesus, this morning. We think about your death, your resurrection. Help us to partake of communion in a meaningful way. And in a powerful way, help us to partake with faith and to receive the very blessings of God for which you, Jesus, suffered and died for us. Oh, help us, oh Lord, to partake in this service in a meaningful and a powerful way. And help us to receive your word, Father, with faith, with understanding. And help us to change our lives according to the truth of your word. Help us to fall in line with your word, oh God. Change our hearts, enlighten our minds, uplift us, O oh God, encourage us, move us forward. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go to the Word of God. We've been sharing in the last several weeks about material prosperity. The great question is, is it good or bad? And I've been trying to say, what the Bible says, that it is very good. A lot of Christian people are of the opinion that it is only bad and evil. But the Bible says it's very good because God made everything and put man in there. In the first chapter of Genesis, we read this, that God made everything, a world full of material resources, and put man in the midst of it, saw man and the things that were made for him, and called it very good. Now, never deviate from that. Now, people, I don't know what has happened to them. They call that bad. They think but they're smarter than God. But God called it very good. So we need to understand why it's very good. And we need to how, understand how we must enjoy it, live with it, how we must use it effectively, and how we must possess these things and so on for the glory of God. That's the whole subject that we're dealing with. Now, I showed you that that's a paradigm, model for mankind, uh, for their life on earth. That's the way life should be. The abundance of everything, uh, living for the glory of God, doing God's work, do, fulfilling God's purposes. And after man sinned and everything got ruined, God begins to do his redemptive work again and again. With Noah it happened, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, and then in a very big way with the people of Israel who were brought out of the land of Egypt into the promised land. And that's what we're looking at right now. And uh, in that, two things we need to notice to see how that is the exact paradigm that he's got in mind even now. The paradigm was set in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, in the beginning itself. This is what life is li to be like. This is what God wants. This is the kind of life God wants for man. God has never changed his mind. So when God brings the people out of Egypt from slavery, he takes them into a good and a vast land, the land that is called the promised land, filled, uh, flowing with milk and honey, the Bible says. We said we'll look at two things about that land. One is the land and then the laws of the land. The two things reveal that God wants prosperity for his people. The land is described as a good land where you can eat to the full. Good land where you can eat to the full and where you will lack nothing. This description is found, as, as I've shown you, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7 to 10. A good land where you can eat to the full, where you will lack nothing. Wonderful description. 
a model for what God wants for our lives so that you may be satisfied with everything that you will not lack any good thing. He wants you to be in a good place, safe and secure. This is the kind of life that God has designed for you and me. We talked about the land, but now we're talking about the laws and let's continue. Now, the laws are very interesting. There's many economic laws, laws about debt, how to lend money, how to collect it back and uh, how you must exercise kindness in all your dealings uh, with people and how you should take care of uh, others who are poor, who are, unfortunate, who, have, who are going through unfortunate situations and circumstances, such as widows and orphans and so on. All of those things are mentioned there. So many laws that were given to the people that were going to go and live in the promised land, that wonderful land, were economic laws. Now think about the Christians today that think that God has nothing to do with economics, you know. I remember dealing with some situation uh, with, with one family and one lady there said, why do you trouble the pastor? He is a pastor. He doesn't know anything about economics. He doesn't know about money and all of those things. Leave him alone, you know. Uh, that poor lady thinks that a pastor means he's just burying his head in the Bible and praying all day. And he has left the whole world and he has nothing to do with the world. So he doesn't understand money at all. He doesn't understand banking, he doesn't have, understand money, he doesn't understand business, he doesn't understand nothing. Well, if you don't understand these things, you can't be doing what we are doing here. When you say we are going on Facebook, that involves all kinds of things. Nobody's going to put you on free for everything, you know. That involves a lot of things, a lot of work that must be done for people, a lot of ability organizationally to bring, up, bring, bring about these things. And we've been working on it for a couple of weeks in order to make these things possible. So, organizationally, you got to do a lot of things, you know. So, it is wrong to think that God has nothing to do with economics. God has much to do with economics. He's the greatest economist. You'll be amazed to find so many economic laws, laws about business in the Bible. Now, there are other laws also. There are laws that are directly laws of economics, you know, about lending and all that stuff. But there are other laws that don't look like they are economic laws and but they are still, they still make an impact on our economic life, such as the Ten Commandments. You look at it, it looks like the Ten Commandments has nothing to do with economics. You know, the ultimate goal of the Ten Commandments is to convince us that we are sinners and to convince us that Jesus is the Savior, to lead us to Christ, in other words. That's the purpose of the Ten Commandments, but that's the ultimate purpose. But in that ultimate purpose, there are a lot of things involved. Ten Commandments, if it is followed today as a guide to life, it will Im impact our economic life also, which is the truth. That's what I've been showing. So last week I started to deal with uh, some of these laws, such as the Ten Commandments. And I've been sharing with you about some factors that are necessary. It must be present in a society or in a person's life in order to bring about prosperity. The laws of God are given to bring about prosperity and to retain that prosperity. That's the purpose of the laws of God. You read about all the laws that were given to the prom people that uh, were supposed to go and live in the promised land. It's to bring prosperity and to retain prosperity so that they will never lose. This is God's will. So, I've been showing you that there are some factors that come into play and uh, I, showed, uh, I shared two of them last week. I want to talk about the second one a little bit more today because I think it's a very important issue. One is, I showed you that there needs to be certain definite spiritual beliefs. Your spiritual belief is very important. Your beliefs uh, of what you embrace as spiritual beliefs are very important because that makes you what you are. And that's uh, that determines your life on all levels, in spirit, soul and body, in economics, everywhere. In your economic life also is determined by what you believe. So what you believe spiritually is very important. I said about spiritual beliefs, I first dealt with the fact that we need to believe that there is a God who is a living God that watches over us. And one day we are going to give account to everything, how we have dealt with our life, how we have spent our life, how we have used our life and so on, one day we're going to give account to him. We're going to give account to him for every day, every minute 
and every resource that he has placed in our hand, we're going to give account to him. That makes a big difference in people's life. When you live with that consciousness, see, that is why the first two commandments are important in the Ten Commandments. What is the first commandment? The first commandment is that you shall have no other gods. Second commandment is about you shall have no images, man-made images. Why? What's wrong with images? What's wrong with the other gods and images? The thing is, when you have images, particularly images, when you have images, what you end up doing is you think that God is somewhere in some building, in some church or, well, in a worship place. So you just go and present yourself before that God and worship and go home. And you are not conscious of that God watching over you and uh, knowing what you are doing. You are just visiting that God, going to that place, attending to something and going back. But that God says, no, no, don't do that. Because that will completely give you a different perspective about who I am. I am not that God who sits in a building. I am a God who is a spirit. I am everywhere. You better know it. I, if you go to... If you go and hide in somewhere in another planet, I am there. Eh? If you go down all the way to hell, also I am there, he says. Eh? You don't, you go anywhere. There is nowhere in this whole universe that you can go to where God is not there. You cannot escape from my sight and my supervision. I am watching over you. So don't put me in a little image and put me in a corner in a building because if you do that, then it you get a misrepresentation of who I am and you do not live with the consciousness that I am watching over you. So this became a very important factor, factor in the pro, uh, doctrine in the Protestant life, you know, uh, about having no images. And uh, because this gives us the, uh, gives us the consciousness that God is watching over us. He is with us all the time that I am doing my duties, my work and everything in His presence and I am accountable to Him. But the second thing is what I want to uh, uh, spend some time on today. The second thing is this, that God wants and uh, desires several character traits related to work and productivity in us. If you want to prosper materially, then God wants certain character traits to be present there. That is a factor in prosperity. Even the other day one person was telling me, writing to me, he says, well, you preach on prosperity, but look at how many people they have nothing, how many people they have, you know, what's the use like, you know. Well, that's right, you know. But why a lot of people don't have nothing? It's not because God wants them not to have anything. That, like a couple of weeks I spent on it. You shall have no poor among you, God says. That's God's will. God is not making people poor. God doesn't want people poor. Then why are they poor? This person is saying, you're preaching poverty, but prosperity, but what is the use? People are in poverty. You know. But why are they in poverty? See, a lot of people don't even pay attention to what we are saying here. Don't even look at and consider these things. Even some Christians don't consider these things that we are talking about here. What we are talking about work and productivity and all that and what the Bible says about it, a lot of Christians don't consider. That is why they never enter into prosperity. Now God has not got a magical way of prospering, you know. There's no magical way to prosper, you see. God can do miracles and all that. But the thing is, prosperity comes as a result of following the principles that God has set for prosperity. I am not preaching some kind of prosperity where I say, I'll pray today, you go and open, the, open your wallet in, at home and you'll find money there, you know. I don't preach such stuff. Yeah. That's foolish. I'm not preaching and saying, you know, let's close our eyes and pray, you'll find gold, you know, all over the floor after I get through praying. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, look at the laws that God has established. Definitely, He has established to establish these laws to bring about prosperity and to retain prosperity, why not consider them? Why not look at them? Okay. So we've been looking at that. There are certain character traits related to work and productivity. We're going to look at many of them, but I want to deal with one here right now. 
as I talk about these character traits that God desires for us to have, one particular character trait about work and productivity is that God wants us to look at our work with a particular outlook. He wants us to have a particular outlook about our work. And that is to think of our work as a calling from God that God has chosen us to do this work and this is our life's task that he has given to us that God has given us the abilities and talents and gifts to do it and when we do it then we are doing what God has appointed us to do now this idea is present all over the scriptures I'm going to read some verses as sample but uh, and during the time I'll probably mention the other I can't read everything but let me just read a few things here this idea of calling work as a calling work as a calling from God therefore why work as a spiritual significance work is not something that is not related to God work is not something that is not separate from our spiritual life work has a lot to do with our relationship with God God has made us you and me for a purpose placed us here in this situation in a place given us certain talents and abilities so that we may do a work which is part of his purpose for the whole world that we may play our role in it that's the whole thing now this is the thing that accounted for the prosperity of the Protestant people even the worldly economists have pointed out there are several books that point that out uh, this out people that don't claim to be Christians or Protestants or anything they point out that Protestant theology is the reason behind the prosperity of the Protestants in Germany and other places of the world where there is a, a concentrated population of uh, pro uh, uh, Protestants there's a uh, there's a lot of prosperity they say and even as they live among other communities they have pointed out that uh, these people excel as owners of businesses and higher up positions uh, being in higher positions and so on in Europe in this I'm talking about 16th century and 17th century now the Protestants have changed I'll show you why also also I'm talking about 16th 17th century economists are saying that they seem to be at an advantage why they seem to be an advantage not because of some spirit uh, of some 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 something that they have imbibed somewhere else it is because what they have learned in Protestant theology what they have learned as a Bible doctrine that is what makes them special and one of the things they point out is they look at work with a totally different outlook they look at it look at it as a spiritual thing that God has chosen them to do this work that God has given to them the talents and the abilities and God has appointed them to do this work this is their life's mission that's how they look at it they go to work with that attitude while the rest of the society in those days looked at work as a nuisance looked at work as a burdensome task looked at work as when is this going to be over you know from the time they enter into the factory to the time they get out they're just looking at the watch you know, when is it going to be over you know I want to get out of here you know that's the attitude but these people because they're taught from the scriptures they had a totally different attitude they go with a terrific motivation to be productive because God is watching they're going to give account to him they don't do eye service because their theology is like that their teaching is like that they work very sincerely and they're very regular they're very productive they're very effective they increase their skill level day by day they excel in the thing that they do it is all originating from the idea of calling so the idea of calling is very important the idea of calling you know the word calling in English itself was interpreted by Martin Luther they say to mean a divine calling you know a divine appointment with a divine purpose he interpreted it like that one of the apocryphal books he was translating from the original languages and there in one verse something about work comes and he is telling about attend your work you know till the end of your life attend to your work or something like that 
and he translated translated it not simply as work with that word in German language. He translated it with that word that means continue with this task that has been given to you by God to the end of your life. That's the way he translates it, it seems. Now, they say after that only that idea caught on and, and, and so on. Uh, but the thing is, Martin Luther translated it like that because he got it from the scriptures. He was a man of the scriptures. And uh, I will read you some verses and show you where he got it from. Let's go from Genesis chapter 1, 128, the verse that we all know. It starts there. Look at that, 128. God blessed them after making Adam and Eve. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over it. There is the mission. <laughs> Man and woman is placed here with a, they're placed here with a mission. They got to be fruitful, multiply, fill it, subdue everything that goes wrong, and dominate over every situation that is not in control and bring it under their dominion. The idea of dominion is to use their authority and power to bring it under their control and exercise dominion because they, have the, they are in the image and likeness of God and they can do it. You know. So they have a task before them. The beginning itself, as soon as God placed them in this world, He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill it, subdue it, dominate. There's enough work there. There's a mission there. Second chapter, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Some translations say to cultivate and keep it. Even in my Bible, the margin says to cultivate. So cultivate is a wonderful word. Cultivate and to keep it means to guard it, protect it. Two things, cultivate and protect it. Cultivate is a wonderful idea. It means that whatever is given to you, you make it better. That's what work is all about. These two verses that I just read to you give us a general idea about our work, the nature of our work. We look at work like this. Since it is given to us by God, we are cultivators. Whatever is given to us, whatever our task is, we take. And whatever is given to us, we take it and make it better. Anything. If a family is given to us, you're given a wife, children, you take it and make it more wonderful and beautiful, right? You're given a business, you take it and make it very successful day by day. You know, you work with it, labor in it and make it beautiful. You are in a profession as a teacher, professor, doctor, lawyer, whatever it is. You know, you take it and make it wonderful day by day. You begin to study it and understand it and work on it and find ways to make it better. That's what cultivation is. Cultivation means that you are not in the same level that you were 10 years ago. You're constantly improving and progressing and flourishing, you know. That's what cultivating means. You take a land that is empty and has no crops in it and make it grow and produce. It involves productivity, shows productivity. That's what cultivation means. And to guard it is to protect it. That means to retain that cultivity, uh, cultivation. Retain it so that it's not robbed, it's not taken away, so that you don't lose it. It's for you to keep, you know. All these ideas are there, way back there itself. But let me read you some other verses also. <clears throat> Turn with me to chapter 3. After the fall, after the sin came, work was affected very much. Work was never the same after the fall. Something happened to man's work. Work was a blessing in the beginning. He was a cultivator and protector. He had abundant resources, more than enough resources. But after the fall, look at verse 17. God says to Adam, he said, Then to Adam, God said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten the, of the tree, from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, 
for dust you are and to dust you shall return look at the impact that the fall has made upon our work in verse 17 it says in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life the word toil indicates hard labor work is not just labor not a delightful enjoyable labor it has become a hard labor now that's what it means work is not easy you know you begin to hate it because because of the curse you know and secondly it says uh, it shall bring forth thorns and thistles why thorns and thistles are there thorns and thistles are trying to choke out what is sown to stop those things that are sown from coming forth and growing and giving you a good crop there are hindrances to your uh, crop and verse 19 says in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread that again indicates the toil so work has been terribly affected now if you if you think work is work has nothing to do with spiritual life you're totally wrong my friend in the fall one of the things that got affected was work man's work and through work his material well being was affected if it's going to be toil he's going to have a hard time making the money if he's going to be if it's going to be that he's going to live out of the sweat of his face then that means he's going to go through economic hardship poverty and suffer without money and food and 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 suffer famine and 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 so on so economics is a very important part of life it was affected in the fall but then look at this god is beginning his redemptive work his work of salvation begins immediately with noah he begins and uh, abraham isaac jacob and joseph every time you see financial miracles that's why have you noticed that some people complain what this story is of abraham isaac and jacob and joseph is full of economics it's always about financial blessings yes why because that is one of the things that got affected in their life also because the fall is working the curse is working because the curse is working there's no water wherever isaac goes because the curse is working there is somebody to pull them down and trample on them everywhere they goes because the curse is working all circumstances are working against them to defeat them and to bring them into a famine situation to cause them to fail because the curse is working but god is working the redeemer is working the one who lifts us is also working so he gets in there while the curse is pulling them down he is a greater power that is pulling them up and in spite of all the curse that is working through the fall abraham made it rich Isaac made it rich, Jacob made it rich, Joseph made it rich, and the people of Israel also made it rich. In spite of the curse. I've said many times, gravity is a law. It's there everywhere. If I step out of here, I'll fall down. Right? If I step out of here, I'm not going to fly. I'm going to go down because that's the law. that means a plane cannot fly but how does a plane fly a plane fly because of another law the law of lift that is made possible through those engines and the design of the air of the airplane so the curse is like a law that pulls us down but god's laws are laws that pulls us up if you are going down economically i'm telling you aren't you aware of the law of god laws of god that god has given to you just like he has given us airplanes these days god has given another law that in spite of the curse you can fly in spite of the gravity planes are flying people are sitting there so the laws are pull, the the curse is a law now since the fall it's pulling down but god's laws every law was designed to lift you up from the downward pull of curse in this world and to bring you to the place that god designed for us originally in chapter genesis chapter 1 and 2 all right now look at this and when he brought the people of israel out of the land of egypt now they are the redeemed people now see how he is making their prosperity and well being possible look at 31 exodus chapter 31 let me read to you from verse 1 then the lord spoke to moses saying see i have called you by name bezalel Uh, uh, see i have called by name bezalel the son of uri the son of her of the tribe of juda 
talking about Bezalel and God says, see, I've called by name this guy. <laughs> he says, God, in other words, God says, I know the guy. I know him by name. If you know somebody na by name, that, that's pretty good knowing, right? When you can't remember the name, you don't really know the person. When you know the person by name, that means you really know him, right? God says, I know him by name. I've called him. Now, notice here the word called. Now, these are the kinds of words that Martin Luther translated as a divine call, as a call in which God has a set job for a person, a set task for a person to do. So the call here with which Bezalel has been called by God, God has called him by name in the sense that there is a divine calling in his life, there is a divine calling in his life to do a particular task. Now notice the verse, next verse. What is the task? I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood and to work in all manner of workmanship. See? God says, I've called him by name. Why? Because I got a task for him. And because of the task, I've been given him gifts, abilities. See how God makes a person worthwhile person. God, how in the, in the fallen world where curse is operating to pull you anytime into famine and lack and want, God chooses a person for a task and gives this redeemed person an ability a mission in life, he's existing for this purpose. His li life's main role is to do this thing that God wants done. He's got a role to play. And for that, God gives him every wisdom and understanding and knowledge that he needs. And every skill that he needs. So this guy can do a lot of things. He can design artistic works. He can work with gold, silver and bronze. Cutting jewels for setting in carving wood and to work all manner of workmanship, he can, he, this guy must be a technically very qualified person. And where did it come from? The Bible says it came from God. It came from God. A lot of people don't realize that. They have no appreciation for the talents and gifts that they possess. They have no appreciation for the talents and gifts they possess. They think of it as cheap, nothing, you know. That's why they don't prosper. Our attitudes must change in order to prosper. If you've got abilities that you can readily acknowledge and readily see and is available right before your eyes, my friend, you're dealing with a gold mine. <laughs> you're dealing with a gold mine. I remember going many years to a many year, long time ago to a house and, uh, and, and, and uh, they prepared food for me and the lady was the finest cook I had ever seen, you know. As a preacher, you, you're like a connoisseur, you know. You get to taste the best foods in town. So she gave such good food and I was so amazed. And they were really, you know, coming out of a lot of debts and just in deep problem and having difficulty for money and all that. I said, look, have you ever thought about cooking? Doing something with your cooking skill? You're an excellent cook. You can do something with it. And you know what? Soon she started a mess. And she started packing lunches and sending to the different places and so on. And they made their living very well with that skill, you know. You're the skill. That, see, a lot of people have the skill but don't even notice it. Don't even acknowledge that it's from God. They have an ability given by God specifically to prosper them. Why do you think God gives you a skill that nobody else has? To prosper you, to make you, to make you come up in life, for you to do well. That's why, you know. And this guy has got so many skills. And verse 6 says, I indeed, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the sons of Aisamek, of the tribe of Dan. And I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. God is trying to get them to make the tabernacle and to do the tabernacle right because it's going to represent the uh, whole idea of salvation. 
is going to teach salvation from it so certain materials have to be used certain designs have to be followed accurately and precisely as god gave it so the tabernacle is not just putting up a tent it's not an ordinary thing they got to follow every little instruction uh, in the wilderness and do it and uh, they got to be correct because it represents the most important thing the salvation through jesus christ it's got to represent and for that god says i have made some people as experts in all this work you got to use gold silver bronze all of these things you have to use but don't worry you got people there i have already chosen them and i have given them wisdom a long time he's been working and getting them ready think about that i don't have all the passages i don't have the time to read all the passages but think about that in the new testament we read about paul he says in galatians chapter 1 that in his mother's womb he was set apart for the gospel ministry to be an apostle unbelievable when he was in his mother's womb he didn't even know in his mother's womb god set him apart and that is how he became an apostle he says you know he acknowledged it much later he became the greatest persecutor of the church not knowing his mission and purpose in life is to preach the gospel but then god turned him around he brought salvation to him and the man got changed for that purpose see he was supposed to be a apostle to the gentiles to go to the gentiles was not a easy thing for the uh, jews jews had a tremendous bias against the gentiles first of all they thought gentiles are made as firewood for hell hell must burn they need firewood so god has made gentiles and we are made for heaven they thought that's the jewish idea somehow they got the wrong idea but actually the bible actually says that god took abraham and his children and blessed them immensely so that other nations will see and be attracted to this god and come to this god so that the whole earth everyone will have the blessings of god and everyone will have salvation that's why the blessing of abraham might come to the gentiles it says through jesus christ that's why jesus died why the blessing of abraham is not just for his children it's for all the gentiles also for all non jews also that's the way the bible teaches it but somehow the jewish people in their bias they missed it they understood it wrongly and missed it so they found it difficult to go to the gentiles so just imagine peter god was trying to after the day of pentecost god was trying to make him go to the gentiles very difficult even god had difficulty persuading him you know peter was sleeping in somebody's house he had to give him a vision of a sheet descending from heaven and all kind of foot all kinds of four footed animals there that jews normally don't eat you know and god says kill and eat and peter says lord you are a jew i am a jew what are you talking about we can't eat all this stuff this is dirty stuff this is unholy stuff we are not supposed to eat this he says kill and eat don't call unclean what i have called clean what god is trying to do is get him to go to the gentiles don't look at them as unclean untouchable don't look at them as unwanted unloved by me they are mine i want to i want to claim them back i want to show them the salvation you go to their house but he's he's trying to stay away while god three times god had to say kill and eat and god knew that's not enough so he gave the address peter's address to cornelius in another town and he sent men to get peter Cornelius is a gentile. He sent men. He's a he's an army officer. Sent men to get Peter, and they come and knock on the door while he is having this vision. And the spirit said, "Go, see that you they've come for you." And he goes down, and they say, "Yeah, we were looking for you." So how do you know my address? Well, God has shown it to Cornelius. He sent us here. So all the miracles God had to do to convince this man it's all right to go to the gentile's house. then he goes to the gentile cornelius house and read the 10th chapter of acts the beginning of the 10th chapter how he begins his sermon i would never begin my sermon like that as a preacher you ought to know better you know but his prejudice is working he begins his sermon you know how men and brethren you know how we don't have anything to do with you all we have nothing to do with you i would not have come to you under normal circumstances but anyway i have come and he apologetically preaches the gospel and god knows this guy is not even going to get them and not not even going to lead them to christ 
So while they were hearing and, and God has prepared their hearts, while they were hearing, God poured the Holy Spirit. God saved them anyway in spite of Peter, you know. He was a hindrance, literally, because of his prejudice and bias. So God thought about reaching the Gentiles. He knew it's going to be a challenge with Peter and all these guys. They're going to be going around Jerusalem, you know, round and round and never get out of it. So God said, I'm going to prepare another man for it. So he raises up Saul in Tarsus as a Roman citizen, living among Gentiles, used to the Gentile world, highly educated, trained, and uh, having a very broad mentality, and able to understand things, and dig deep into things, and know things, and raises him from that situation, so that when Paul comes, he completely demolishes all these foolish Jewish ideas, you know. Jews became, at, at one point they become their, his great enemies, because they thought he was the enemy of the Jews, you know. He was so Gentile-minded. He was able to accept the Gentiles readily. Go to the Gentiles. He's the one who said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. As it is written, curse it is everyone that hangs on a tree. So that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. You know how difficult it is to, for a Jew to say that out of his mouth? Yes, the blessing of Abraham must come to the Gentiles. That's why Jesus died. That's why I'm preaching to the Gentiles, he says. See how God works. Before Paul even knew, God was at work in his mother's womb. And before Paul even knew Christ, while he was being raised in Tarsus, God is at work. God is at work in making him a Roman citizen and, and raising him up in that circumstances. Why? Because he was preparing him for a task. And the man was qualified, prepared, and made ready for the task that God has appointed for his life. It was a life task that God has committed to him. That's the mission of Paul's life, to be an apostle of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Finally he found it, and he fulfilled it. Calling. Moses, similarly. The people of Israel would not have been delivered by any other person other than Moses. Because everybody was slaves for more than, for so many hundreds of years they've been slaves. How can you get a slave to go and talk to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go? No slave will talk boldly to Pharaoh. They'll stand like this before Pharaoh. So what God did was, he knew that this is going to be impossible because they're going to be filled with such inferiority and unbelief and small-mindedness as slaves very, going to de very difficult to bring them and make them a leader. So what God did, he took Moses as a little child and made him enter the house of Pharaoh by divine providence, working, orchestrating things there. God caused Moses to become Pharaoh's grandson. And Pharaoh paid for his food, his stay, he sat with the king on the king's table and ate, raised like a king's child, full of confidence, beaming with confidence, very well educated, raised up rich and famous and, and uh, influential and powerful. And then he becomes the deliverer. Then only he goes and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. He's the one that can deal with Pharaoh. Now you got a man who's prepared for the task. What I'm saying is, calling is something that we need to understand from the word of God. Calling comes from God. Even the carpenters and workers in Exodus 31 were called. Moses, the great leader of the Jews, was called. Paul, the great apostle, was called. So from ordinary work of carpentry and other things, to the great work of being an apostle, everything is a calling. That's the biblical idea. That God puts people in this world, gives them specific abilities, so that he can, they can fulfill a specific role in the plan and purpose of God. That's how God works. The idea of calling. Now, this is the thing that was preached among the Protestant groups in the 16th to the 18th, 17th century. This is what 
was preached and it impacted the society in a very major way they say that this made people a new kind of people a new kind of man what kind of man rational ordered diligent and productive that kind of a man different man in those days in the 16th 17th century people were not like that but the people that were trained by the protestants were like this rational ordered diligent and productive it produced new kind of businessmen new kind of workers in the factories with new kind of attitude new kind of outlook and there are many traits and out of that one particular trait is this that their calling their their work is their calling and if you ask them what is their what is what is what is the calling they would say the calling is a work that god set for me a task set by god a life task a definite field in which i should work that's what a calling meant to the people during the days of reformation as martin luther and the reformers taught this idea you know now so look at the change in the attitudes of people now this is very important because in those days work was a lowly thing considered as a lowly thing it's a burdensome task it's a cursed thing you know it's just you'd rather not do it you know and if you don't have to do it you know you, you you're just a blessed person hope you you know are born in a family or something that where you don't have to work at all and go to work at all and that's the blessing you know work is considered as a threatening burdensome tough task that you don't want to ever deal with that's the way they thought about it and when they thought about calling they only thought about that some people are called who is called the people that are called into ministry and in those days before martin luther people that are called into ministry they did not marry they went to a monastery and they gave up all comforts of life and other worldly work and all that they called all other work worldly work uh the name itself denotes something lowly you know worldly work you know it has no spiritual significance it has no importance it has no value worldly work they said so anybody that was doing anything else is worldly work and uh, only the ministry where you leave everything and where you have given up everything all comforts of life so that you don't even wear pro- uh, you know proper clothes or you don't even sleep on a bed sleep on the hard floor and you don't even eat proper food and you give up all comforts and give up even marriage and family and all of that and go and join that is what a calling is all about that's how you please god that's the way they thought about it they said that's the calling if you come and give up everything and join like that then that is the highest kind of thing that you can do in this earth highest kind of work that you can do on this earth that's the work that is hallowed holy good and has value before god and in that society this transformation ha- was happening the fundamental idea of work was changed where now they are teaching that not just you know it's not like that that every work is the highest kind of activity that you can do when you think about it as the call of god a job or a task that is set by god for you as a life task if you do that work in that way when it is like that how can you say it is lowly it is the highest thing that you can do it is the best that you can do your work whatever you are if you're a carpenter teacher doctor professor whatever whatever work you do if that is the call of god upon your life if that if god has given you the intelligence the wisdom and understanding and knowledge to do it then you are indeed a person who is working out your calling and therefore that is the greatest thing that you can do 
That's the greatest thing that you can do. Now, remember at this time, Martin Luther was a, himself a monk. He was himself a monk. He has given up everything. He has, he has given, married, given, up, given up married life, given up all comforts of life. He has said no to all these other things, you know, all you know, material comforts and all of that. And he has turned into a monk. He wanted to serve God. And he also thought of work in the way that others of his friends in that profession thought, uh, thought of work, and the way they, they thought of. The way they thought of is this, is this, that yeah, you have to work because you have to work in order to eat. How will you earn without work? So you have to work. It's the will of God. God has made us like that. You got to work. We agree with that, they said. But it's a thing of the flesh. It's a worldly thing. That's the way they talked about it. You got to work, but it's not some, something very valuable. It's not something very high or mighty or anything like that. It's something that you just have to do because you need to pay your rent, you need to buy your food, you just have to work. That's the kind of idea they had. And Martin Luther also thought about it. It's some, uh, some kind of a low task that, uh, you know, you just have to do it because of necessity, of compulsion. But that is not the highest kind of thing that one would want to do. But then, you remember, as he was living like that, he was dealing with this idea of justification by faith. This thing was coming into him. He began to get a revelation of how a person is saved. The emphasis in the church that he, that he was in was on the works. That faith alone was not enough. But work was necessary. That you got to do certain things. So they prescribed certain definite things that you need to do in order to get saved and so on. You got to follow certain rituals and so on. So he was fighting against that, showing that that's not the scriptures and he got a revelation, a mighty revelation. It's nothing that I do, but it's everything that God has done through Jesus Christ on the cross, not my works. It's by his grace, therefore it is by faith. Only it can be received. Because it's by grace, it can only be received by faith. If it's by works, you know, that I, that I should receive it. You know, it's not right, they said. So he was dealing with this thing and he was coming into that revelation and beginning to understand justification by faith. How man is saved by purely by just faith in Christ. Not by any works, but by faith in Christ you are saved. And as he was doing it, he was thinking about constantly about his works and God's grace. And merits due to works and God's grace which is free gift. He was thinking along those lines. Then all of a sudden he began to look at himself and say, if that is true, if, what, if the revelation that I am getting about this is true, then all my giving up this and that, my renunciation of all these earthly comforts and material things and all of these things mean nothing. Count as nothing before God. His eyes were open. He said, what am I living like this for? Why? God never required me to live like this. God never asked me to live like this. This is not the thing that God wants from me. This is not what I should do in order to please God. You know, I shouldn't sleep on the floor to please God. I shouldn't eat just, just a handful of food to please God. I should not... Uh, live in lowly circumstances in order to please God. Why am I doing this? Who am I trying to please? God doesn't want me to do these things. These, the renunciation of these things, the material comforts in the world, means nothing to God. It does, it does not bring me any merit. God is a God of grace. He loves me. And because He wants to give me everything, He made this world and everything in it, and man lost it, Adam lost it through sin and became a slave of sin and Satan. But now through Jesus Christ he has redeemed us. All of these things belong to us. It is there for our enjoyment and our use. Why am I doing this? My renunciation of these things mean nothing to God. It is insignificant in God's eyes. God doesn't need it. There was a complete turnaround when he realized that. He looked upon his renunciation 
of the duties of this world as a product of selfishness. He says, when God has endowed me so richly with his abilities to do certain things and called me for a purpose and has a set task for me, something that I must accomplish in my lifetime, when God has done that, how can I leave all that and sit in a corner? That is selfishness, he says. Many people left everything and actually they'll go into a room, never come out for days and just stay there. They thought only reading and praying and this, you know. And there are places where you can never even, never go out, never do anything, because everything is worldly, you know. You don't, want, you don't want the world, you know. You don't want to enjoy anything in the world. That kind of thing was there. And he realized, well, that is selfishness. That means you're keeping all the gifts that God has given for yourself. You are not doing anything with it. You are not being a blessing to others. You are not using it so that others will benefit from it. You are not doing anything. You are just keeping it for yourself. So that you can look good before God. That's all you are doing. It is selfishness, he said. In contrast, he thought about work, our labor in a calling as an outward expression of brotherly love. Totally his attitude changed. Renunciation means nothing to God. My labor in the calling that God has given to me. When I go down, get down to work and do that which I'm called to do and pay attention to it and do it to the best of my ability that God has given to me and develop my skills and cultivate myself to do it even better every day. When I do that, that is what is an expression of brotherly love. Now I'm not living for myself. I am realizing that I am meant to live for others. I should be blessed and be a blessing to others. God has blessed me with talents and abilities and I should be a blessing to others. This is the secret of prosperity. Prosperity does not come just like that. It comes when a person realizes I am made for something, I am called for something, I am blessed with certain abilities for a particular task that I am supposed to do in this world. God has kept me here for a purpose. And a person realizes that then it clicks. He begins to live, not just for himself. He realizes that I must do something with all that I have. He begins to pay attention. A lot of people don't pay any attention to the way they do their job. You know, don't pay any attention to developing their skills. Don't pay any attention to being faithful in their job. Don't pay any attention to being regular to work. A lot of eye services involved. No effort to see the work done beautifully, gloriously and wonderfully, the thing that you're doing, to excel in that. There is no effort to do that. And that is why prosperity never comes. It begins with an appreciation for what God has given to me. That's where it begins. Once you realize that this is God-given ability, then I must work with it. Then you will begin to work with it. Once you realize, well, I'm, say, I'm gifted to be a doctor one day, then while everybody is sleeping, you'll be studying. Because you better study. And you got to study a lot and study for many years. You give your life, dedicate yourself for that, to the task. Why? Because there is a strong belief that this is your calling in life. It's what I'm supposed to do. If you believe that you're called to be a teacher, that that's your heart's inclination, that's the ability, that's the desire that God has put. See, God works through desires. I've talked about that. As God has shown you that this is what you should be doing, that's where your heart is, that's where you're going, then you better start paying a lot of attention to it. You better appreciate every opportunity that is given to you and you better start doing it faithfully as you do it before God and work honestly and faithfully and work with all your strength, with all your might to do everything beautifully and wonderfully for the glory of God. I'll tell you, my friend, such a person can never fail. 
can never fail. Like I said last week, if your boss doesn't promote you and doesn't give you a better salary, God has a better place for you. <laughs> There's plenty of fish to fry. There's so many places in the world to go to, so many things to do, and there is a God who can lead you and make all things possible for you. So, <laughs> so don't worry about, uh, you know, all that. The first adjustment that needs to be made is in your heart and in your mind, in our heart, in our mind. And that is the adjustment where we say, I am not just trying to meet my rent bill and food bill. That's not what I'm working for. I am working because I have a call of God in my life. I'm called to do something. I've given divine ability to do something. There is a task that I have to do. God is interested in my hand. Therefore, I will work with all my strength and I'll work sincerely. And as God is watching, and I'm going to do it. Whether anybody cares, appreciates, it doesn't matter, I'm going to do it. Once that attitudinal change happens, then financial changes will come about in due time. That is only a byproduct of this attitudinal change. Amen? And I tell you, every single one of you is meant for success. God is not a God of partiality. We must begin where we must begin. We must begin with the calling, who we are, who God is, why he has made us, what he has put within us. That's where we begin. And that's where everything begins. Your future is in that. God bless you. Let's all stand together. Remember, Joyce Mayer registration is done in our book desk. There are separate people that are doing that so that you can do it quickly. So please go there and get that done if you want. Let's pray. Let's lift up our hands and give thanks to God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come. We thank you for this opportunity to hear your word in this way, O oh God. Thank you for encouraging us. Thank you for uh, giving us the hope that all of us, every one of us, no matter who we are, where we come from, what our present situation is, we have a bright and beautiful, wonderful future in you. That there are principles that has lifted us while the circumstances in the world is pulling us down because of the curse that is present. The laws of God are in our favor. The laws of God are given to lift us, to cause us to succeed and excel beyond all expectations. And I pray that people will put these laws into motion in their lives, that they will succeed in a major way in everything that they put their hands to do. May they be blessed and be a great blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each and every one of us for now and forevermore. Amen.